here we go. It's 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock in Mountain Time, 9 o'clock Pacific Time. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the weekly chat. I'm Doug Schnitzbein. I'm the editor of Outdoor Retailer Magazine. Uh, and what we do here is we dive deeper into the ideas of a prominent force in the outdoor industry whom we featured in the magazine. Uh, today's topic is net zero now, creating standards and accelerating the shift to a decarbonized world. Our guest is Austin Whitman, the CEO of Climate Neutral. And uh, we previously had a good conversation that's uh, printed in the current issue of Outdoor Retailer Magazine, which you can find on the site. Uh, we'll be talking about the work the nonprofit does and how it continues to grow and evolve its mission. Uh, this is a Zoom chat, but uh, we really like to have you involved and we love questions. If you do have a question during the chat, and we would love to hear that, uh, you can submit it at the bottom of your toolbar by clicking the Q&A tab. Uh, the questions will go directly to the moderator. They're not gonna be shown publicly. And I will go through those. We're gonna try to get through all the questions you have. Uh, there's a lot of people here, but we do uh, like to do that. And if we can't get to any questions, uh, Sarah, our moderator from OR, will make sure that Austin and his team get those uh, so that he can respond to you later. Um, another great thing is this Zoom session is being recorded. You can access the on-demand file on Outdoor Retailer's website after the conversation as well. Uh, so let's get into it. The uh, nonprofit Climate Neutral was created in 2019 by Peter Daring, the founder and CEO of Peak Design, and Jonathan Cedar, the founder of BioLite. Uh, and it launched at the summer 2019 Outdoor Retailer Show, uh, even though uh, the, the mission of the brand goes beyond outdoor brands. But, uh, and Daring, Cedar, and Alex Honnold were featured on the cover of The Daily, that show, uh, made a big splash. Uh, the mission of the nonprofit is to help brands in all industries measure, offset, and rescue the carbon it takes to make their products. Uh, it provides a calculator to help do that and a certification that's somewhat similar to organic certification to help inform customers, but Austin will talk more about that. Uh, when Climate Neutral launched, it, had, uh, it claimed 12 brands, uh, but after OR in the next two months, it, it built up another 50 companies. And now Climate Neutral has over 300 committed brands from several different industries. Um, Austin Whitman, who is with us today, is the founding CEO of Climate Neutral, and he's worked in technology, climate, and clean energy for over two decades, including gigs at Climate Change Capital and First Fuel Software. Uh, with that, I'm going to have Austin tell you a bit more about <clears throat> Uh, climate neutral and what it does, and also what net zero is and what climate neutral is hoping to achieve. So welcome, Austin. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for that intro. I'm going to attempt to cleanly put up some slides here. How's that looking? Looks great. Okay, good. Well, that's us, climate neutral. Um, so I will make this pretty short on the slideware, but uh, put together a couple interesting things on the outdoor industry, and then I'll try to tie it together with uh, the concept of net zero. So first of all, some, some rough numbers. The U.S. outdoor industry, depending on whose numbers you look at, has about $400 billion in annual sales. And we can equate that to the amount of carbon roughly um, and estimate that about 200 million tons of carbon emissions are attached to the activities of the outdoor industry. And that's, you know, that's a rough estimate based on what we know about the carbon intensity of, you know, companies doing business. So it's often hard to contextualize kind of what a ton of carbon is. So that's equivalent to roughly 46 million cars driving for a year. It's a lot of cars. Um, and to suck up that carbon, you'd need to plant 44 billion trees, which basically means having a highly productive forest that is about 73 million acres in size. And I'll give you the opportunity to guess what state that is if you're <laughs> going back to your elementary school state mapping. It's Arizona. So Canyon State. Yep. So if you so if you covered Arizona with a highly productive kind of middle aged forest, <laughs> um, you know, forests tend to sequester more carbon as they get older um, up to a point. And if you covered the state of Arizona with that much forest, you would roughly speaking 
be able to suck up the amount of carbon in a year that the outdoor industry is responsible for. Of course, not all of America is forestable or forested. So that's actually about 10% of the total forest that exists in the US. So the, you know, the point is that the outdoor industry does have a large impact on climate change. And a lot of companies have been taking steps to address that impact, which is great, but we got a lot of work to do. Um, so that's the first set of numbers. Here's the second set of numbers. The good news is we're all more concerned about climate change than ever. So I started working on climate issues almost 20 years ago. And we'll say that the, the moment in time that we're, that we're at right now is, is completely different from what I've ever seen. So when you look at polling data on attitudes toward climate change, about three quarters of us are generally concerned about climate change. We think global warming is important to deal with and important for all the brands that are part of the outdoor community. Uh, people really think that the sustainability of brands matters. And this has presented us an opportunity. Uh, in particular, it's an opportunity because the politics around climate change have not led to meaningful policy. So, you know, it's been difficult to get any sort of policy passed that will deal with climate change in an urgent way. And yet people really care about it. People care about climate change. So what we've tried to do with climate neutral is to tap into this sense of concern with, um, with a way for, for people to get involved. I'll say more about that later, but at the corporate level, what this has led to around the world is about 1500 net zero pledges. And this means that companies, cities, investors are all making pledges and promises to reach net zero by 2050 mostly by 2050. So that's an important thing that you'll see in this chart, which is that a lot of people have said, all right, cool, 2050 is the year we need to reach net zero. And that number has been chosen because when you look at all the science, 2050 is generally speaking kind of the target year where if we don't reach net zero as a globe, uh, the worst effects of climate change will start to really start to manifest. We will have crossed a threshold that is kind of beyond the point of no return. We'll start to see you know, every, everything bad that you've heard about, we'll see it just in spades. And so 2050 is this year where we need to trend emissions down and, um, and bring them down to net zero by 2050. So a lot of companies, a lot of cities have chosen that year to set targets. Now I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into, into graphs. Actually, before I do that, um, when you look at a net zero target, you know, there, there's all kinds of sort of analytical ways of, of, of thinking about how net zero targets are constructed, but I like to boil it down to three questions. The first question is how much? So how much of your carbon are you counting and taking responsibility for? How much are you going to reduce? How soon? So how soon are you planning to reduce your emissions and how soon are you planning to get to net zero? And then finally, how? So how are you going to get to net zero? What kinds of things are you going to do as an individual, as a company, to invest in new technologies, to change the way your business makes its products or ships them around the world. So if you think about those things, every time you hear a company say, we're net zero by 2030 or 2050 or 2040, you can sort of make a little bit more sense of them. How much are you counting? Are you just counting your employee commuting or are you counting a lot more of your emissions? Uh, how soon are you going to reach net zero and then how are you going to do it? Now back to slides or back to graphs. Um, so just to kind of illustrate one of the, one of the risks of that 2050 timeframe, uh, this represents the annual emissions between 2021 and 2050 of a company that's about 20 to $25 million in revenues, annual revenues, so 10,000 tons per year. And what you see is for the next five, six years, the company's emissions are, are still going up a little bit, but by 2026, the company's on a downward tra trajectory. And the first real question is, how are companies going to achieve that type of downward path? And I think if you ask a lot of companies how they're going to do it, they don't know. And companies that have set goals, really ambitious goals for 2030 or 2040 simply just don't know. And part of that is because they're going to have to rely on technologies that don't exist yet. So there's a lot of uncertainty in how we're going to get that downward, downward path to exist. And even if we do, 
let's say that this company follows exactly this type of emissions trajectory. Over the next 30 years, the cumulative emissions of this company will be close to 180,000 tons. So while this company is reducing its emissions, it will continue to emit. And so all that climate pollution goes up into the atmosphere and it stays there. So it's contributing to the total atmospheric climate or carbon, carbon dioxide that causes climate change. And that is a problem because over time we need to actually get that carbon out that has been created historically. So an alternative to this is actually for that company to invest immediately in near term ways of addressing its carbon pollution. And what this represents is a company that the, the same company, but that decides in a couple of years to start balancing out its emissions, its annual emissions with investments in things that sequester or capture carbon immediately. And there's a pretty big difference between the cumulative emissions for that company under this scenario versus under that scenario. And the emission trajectory for the company is effectively you know, the same. So we're following that same expectation that over time the company is able to get its emissions down low. Um, and, and down to zero by 2050. But the important thing is that investing in the near term means that you're not actually having to, at some point, you know, deal with the accumulated emissions from not investing in near term solutions. And then the thing that a lot of people don't like to even contemplate is what happens if this green line is just not achievable? Or what happens if we don't actually start down that trajectory until 2030 or, or 2040? And that's a real risk when it comes to climate. So that's something that we think about a lot, which is the, the possibility that reductions are just a whole lot easy, a whole lot harder to, to achieve than, than people want them to be. And you know, going back to the earliest years when I was working on climate change, uh, I'm kind of reminded of 2005 when a lot of people said, all right, 2020 is the year that we're going to reduce emissions by 20%. So from 2005 to 2020, we'll reduce emissions 20%. 20 by 2020 was the big sort of milestone. Any guesses as to whether emissions dropped by 20% by 2020? I'm going to guess no. Uh, emissions have risen 33%. So since, since 2005. So I guess I, I'm always very wary of long-term trajectory and trajectories and targets because of the, you know, it basically invites this opportunity to say, oh yes, we'll deal with that at some point in the future. So anyhow, uh, that's my that's my slide where you asked for it, you got it. Um, but now I'd love to kind of get into the-, the yeah, We already have a question actually from a listener. Someone wants to know if 2050 is too late to reverse the current trends. I guess they're saying that, is that- and I think that works into what you're saying. Do you think that looking at 2050 is actually, we should be looking sooner? I mean, you know, I just sort of point to this, what the scientists say, right? And, and science says that 2050 to get to 1.5 degree, uh, meaning we'll continue on some of the current trend, but we'll, able, we'll be able to, to stop the, the warming trend and, and cap it at 1.5 degrees C, which is, seen as a bit of a, of a tipping point, um, that if we have 100% certainty that we'll get to net zero by 2050, then, you know, and you trust the models, then that's where, that's where we'll, we'll get to. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm always maybe, uh, you know, a little bit more worried than, than I think, um, maybe you know, some, some people are in terms of the, the likelihood of actually getting there by 2050. Um, and you know, even if you believe some of the more extreme predictions, which actually most, most of the science as we've, um, you know, as we've seen it kind of unfold has generally you know, predicted scenarios that we're actually seeing um, you know, that are on the worst end of what projections, potential projections have been. So, I think it, there's a possibility that we get to 2050 and things are actually far worse than people have, have expected. And I, I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of, you know, pick words to not sound like a total doomsayer, but, um, but yeah, I think we need to get to, I, we need to get some aggressive action quickly. 
I guess one question I have too, especially looking at that 33% more at, at 2020, how much of that comes from, you know, the US and how much of that comes from, you know, developing nations that are, don't have the ability and are fighting just to survive right now, you know, and, and not thinking about offsetting carbon or. Yeah, I mean, that's a bit, been a big point of debate since, you know, climate negotiations began in the early 90s, you know, kind of how much of this burden should be borne by the developed countries. And, you know, it gets into kind of an ethical argument as much as a scientific one. Um, you know, there's no question that on a per capita emissions basis, you know, we, we Americans are far greater, far higher, even than a lot of European countries, uh, because we drive a lot, we live in big houses and so forth. Um, and... So any one individual, any one company that's you know, solely doing business in a developing country is going to have nowhere near the opportunity to reduce, to cut emissions as we are here. On the flip side, we have a lot more money here to invest in technology. So I think, you know, the, just the, um, the economic power of, the, of this country, you know, it really has to be pushed in the direction of zero carbon. Sure. Um, I, I think that's a great introduction to net zero and what that is, but uh, maybe we should move now. We've got some more questions coming in too. I think we can get into after we ask you this though, but tell us now about what climate neutral is and, and what you guys do uh, to combat this. Yeah, so to tie a couple of those things together that I just talked about, I mean, we're, we, we um, produced a label called climate neutral certified. And this is um, our way of harnessing some of that concern that we think consumers have. And basically, you know, if you look at an individual's carbon emissions, there's the car that you drive or the airplane miles that you travel. Um, and then there's this big chunk of emissions that are tied to the things that you buy. So all the, all the things that we kind of consume day to day objects, whether it's backpacks and hiking boots or whether it's food, um, that has a big footprint attached to it. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of make people aware of the connection between things that they buy and the carbon emissions um, that they're responsible for. And then to provide an easy way of, of picking products, picking brands that have done three things. One, measured their carbon emissions. Two, worked to mitigate those carbon emissions by investing in, uh, in solutions to suck carbon out of the atmosphere or to avoid carbon being emitted and then three to work on a reduction uh work on a reduction plan so that the company's actually emissions are going down over time so we um we have this label that we created and about 150 companies are using it now uh starting next month we'll have about 280 companies using it and it really becomes that clear signal that a company is taking those actions to, to reverse its carbon, carbon emissions. Um, we're a, uh, a small nonprofit and have so far had tremendous, um, I think, timing in terms of uh, you know, the, what's going on generally and people's awareness of climate change and the problem and um, hoping that we'll get to about 500 companies by the end of this year and possibly into the thousands in the near future. And I think it's important, right, that, uh, you know, you, you have committed companies, companies who wanted to want to work with you guys and can work to reduce their their carbon. But the companies that are certified are only the companies that are at net zero. Correct. That's right. Yep. Yep. You have to have taken those three steps to get certified. And that's that's something that we feel very strongly about that, you know, the, the average consumer shouldn't have to spend a lot of time deciphering carbon content labels and comparing, you know, the carbon content of one thing to another. It's really, you know, much, much easier. And it's, therefore, it's going to be much easier for a larger number of people to respond to if that label just means one thing, one thing for every, every product that you see it on. But, uh, but what you guys do makes it a lot easier for, for brands to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, make that commitment to really get there too. Yeah, and, and something you know that we've that we've heard a lot from companies is that you know, they're they may have invested in sustainability in the past. They may have heard that climate is really important to be thinking about, but they just don't have the bandwidth or don't have the the knowledge to really put together a plan. And that what we give them is in essence a way of getting started without having everything figured out. And it gives them a framework. It gives them, um, you know, kind of a credible approach that they can work on and meet other companies in the process who are also working on the same issues. And, uh, you know, let, let's not let, you know, perfect stand in the way of action. And, um, you know, and that's been really valuable for companies. 
Sure. We've already got a ton of questions in here. Some are really good. Uh, let's get to some of those before we move on to our conversation a bit. Uh, I think this one goes right into what we're talking about right now is, do you have specific numerical requirements for emissions reductions target settings? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't currently require numerical uh, reduction targets. We, we do require companies to specifically disclose what they're going to be working on and then um, to report progress on those targets every year. So if a company says, you know, we're working with one of our suppliers to install solar panels to reduce the emissions from production for manufacturing, um, that'll be a measure that's that's stated one year and then the next year they have to come back and say how far they are along that project. Sure, uh, and that, that, that works into another another question we had is how often do you check in with brands to make sure yeah. they're net zero? Yeah, yeah it's, an, it's an annual process. Um, and, and, and to kind of, you know, go back to the, the question of numeric targets, we are looking at that actively. Uh, there's an initiative called the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which we um, respect. It's, there's a tremendous amount of thinking that's gone into it. And they do, for certain companies, large, large companies in particular, require quantitative target setting, um, but not necessarily annual check-ins on it. So there's sort of, you know, there's no reason to, to necessarily make our own rules about everything. And I think there's some opportunity to, to piggyback on what they're doing. So we're looking at that actively. Sure. On um, this next question, I'm going to kind of combine two questions here. Someone wants to know, uh, you know, if you assist companies in the offsite process, which I, I believe you do. And also uh, someone wants to know the, the difference between, uh, you know, how, how benefits different uh, between buying carbon offsets versus developing a reduction plan. Wouldn't it be better to reduce your input? There's, we're so far in general from where we need to be on, on, on the scale of investment that's happening. And, you know, the, the debate about offset or reduce to me is, you know, it, it's, it sort of misses the broader point that like nobody's doing anywhere close to what needs to happen. So yes, it would be better to reduce all your emissions immediately, but nobody seems to, you know, be able to figure out how to do that. And that's just the reality of where we are today. Um, so Yes, it's, it's important to reduce your emissions. Yes, it's important to offset them. I think it's a both and question. And can, can you become a climate neutral company simply by offsetting or do you also have to? You have to because we're looking back at last year's emissions. So, you know, the kind of the, the term of art that people are using more and more is, you know, is compensate, you know, as opposed to offset, you sort of compensate for your emissions and work on a longer term reduction strategy that gets you down to net zero or, you know, if not, if not entirely through your operations, then at least net zero plus some residual, um, you know, removals that you're committed to using kind of in forever, I guess. Um, but yes, you have to use offsets. And do you, and to go back to that other question, you, and you guys assist companies in the offset mm -hmm. process. Yeah, we've got a framework for carbon offsets that we put together with about a dozen external advisors. Um, actually our first meeting for uh, that process is this year, or oh, sorry, the first meeting for this year's process is, is tomorrow. Um, and what we do there is we look at the best thinking of, you know, kind of how to look at the carbon offset market and how to pick credits that are higher quality, lower risk, uh, and are going to meet the objectives that we have around both climate as well as um, some other goals that uh, people often, often like. The outdoor industry in particular is, really uh, interested in, as you can imagine, in ecosystem health and restoration and you know, finding projects that improve ecosystem health while also providing carbon benefits. Sure. And uh, someone also wants to know if there's, if there's a cost and is it dependent on size? Um, I mean, yeah, the, the, the biggest cost is, is offsetting. The biggest cost is, 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 is paying to, to mitigate, to clean up your carbon emissions. And it's typically dependent on size uh, as long as you're talking about a company that makes physical products. So services companies like a software company will have lower carbon emissions for every dollar of revenue than a company that makes outdoor equipment. Um, we also charge a certification fee which helps cover about a third of our operating budget. And that fee is based on um, 
the number of tons of emissions. Ideally, somebody's emissions go down over time and you know, we make less money. And that's sort of the, the, the design. Um, another interesting, we'll, we'll get in our conversation more. There's so many questions here, but uh, another person wants to know if a company's already a B Corp uh, doing their part for the environment. Uh, they're saying there's so many labels out there. Why should you join that neutral if you're already, uh, or, or climate neutral, uh, if you're already uh, a B Corp? Yeah, we, we collaborate a lot with B Corp. Um, and the, you know, the short answer to that is B Corp's certification matrix certification scheme has a lot of different measures that they look at. And so it's not just about climate. Um, what we hope is that companies will do both because we're specifically focusing on climate change and a company that becomes certified has a very strong strategy and plan in place to deal with carbon emissions that isn't necessarily required of a B Corp certification, but you know, B Corp does cover a whole bunch of metrics that we don't, we don't cover. Um. All right, well, uh, we still have a lot of questions. But I'll still try to get to all these, but uh, maybe moving on. And I think the, the next question I have for you that I think also works into some of the, the listener questions here is you had told me that you guys have been kind of surprised that you also uh, have sort of become a tech company as well as a mm -hmm. carbon reduction company at this point with the, cal the calculator uh, you've developed. And, and one of our listeners wanted, wants to know if you have tools to calculate emix emission reduction efforts uh, and I think that works right into the idea that how have you guys have become more of a tech company at this point as well, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's been a kind of a, a positive, I think that we've, we've figured out a way to use technology and we're continuing to think about new ways to <laughs> improve how we use technology to get over these kind of initial questions that companies have about where their carbon emissions are coming from and what they can do about them. We, um, as you mentioned early on, we, we decided that we would build a a piece of software because there really wasn't a whole lot that's available to help companies just simply estimate their carbon emissions. Where are their carbon, where's their carbon coming from? And to do it in a way that doesn't require a lot of external investment, you know, kind of one of the, one of the, one of the founding insights behind the organization was that you could spend a whole lot more on a consultant than it actually costs to offset and reduce your carbon foot, footprint. And that sort of feels like it puts the money into the wrong bucket. So the more we can push that money forward into actually kind of, dealing with your carbon emissions less into measurement, I think the closer we get to, to real to real impact. Like there's this, there was a um, you know, a lot of discussion at the beginning of 2020 about how now we've hit the decade of carbon awareness, carbon transparency, carbon reporting. And it just felt like this kind of really, you know, mixed up uh, declaration that if we just get at the end of this decade, if we just get to a point where everybody knows what their carbon emissions are, when are we going to reduce them? When are we going to, to do something about them? So we're trying to accelerate that as much as possible by providing tools that are low cost and easy to use and get businesses on the path. And you don't have to figure everything out on day one. And you know, I think that's one of, the, one of the most important things is that with not a lot of expertise, you can get in and you can start to start to make some meaningful assessments of what your biggest opportunities are. And this is kind of how you guys started, right? I remember Peter telling me before you even launched, that this was what he he wanted to know just how much carbon they were using, right? And this is kind of the, mm -hmm. the genesis of how you guys decided to create a calculator and then figure out what you could do to to reduce an offset, right? Yep, 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 absolutely, yeah. And, and that's, again, I think the real opportunity here is to take an industry that has, you know, to some extent, really focused on measurement for measurement's sake and to turn that into something that's, you know, an initial, you know, estimate that is, is for the sake of action. And I think there's a question here that, that leads into expanding, talking about uh, the calculator aspect too. I mean, this calculator is pretty complex, right? Someone wants to know, is anything taken into account for physical waste during the manufacturing process or is it specifically? So the calculator is pretty comprehensive and broad in, in what you guys look at in the, in the whole process and supply chain and manufacturing, right? Yeah, we, we follow the greenhouse gas protocol framework, which is, the global standard around carbon measurement and it very kind of neatly separates your carbon emissions into different types of sources and so waste would be what's considered one of part of your one of your scope 3 emission sources and typically waste in manufacturing is not a huge chunk of your carbon footprint um, the bigger bigger chunks of carbon emissions 
assuming you make physical products would be the stuff that you're buying that's coming into the factory that's being turned into your finished product. Um, so all the content that goes into a pair of shoes or into a backpack you know, has an upstream carbon footprint that has to be counted. And then things like shipping your products around the world um, to, your, to your end customer, those also have emissions. So we've built the tool, we've built the certification process around a, what's called a boundary that you put kind of a, a boundary on what you're counting and what you're not counting. It starts with the raw materials and ends with the product being brought to you you know, Doug, kind of the pack, the box lands on your doorstep, you open it up and there's your new pair of shoes. Um, and that's the, that's the, kind of the boundary, all, all the carbon it took to make the product and then bring it to you. And this is another thing someone wanted to know if you require hundred percent of those scope three emissions to be offset. We don't count what's known as use phase emissions <laughs> and we don't count disposal emissions. And we've chosen to do that for a variety of reasons, um, starting with it's just very, very difficult to assign those emissions and model them out much more so than it is to count the emissions that are further upstream. Um, a couple more questions here, I think, from people that are pretty good. Uh, if someone wanted to know again if, uh, you know, to join clim climate neutral, do you just need to plan to reduce an offset or do you actually need to get to neutral within a certain amount of time? Yeah, there's if, for offsetting has to be completed before certification is complete. So it's an annual process, as I mentioned. We're we're in the middle of it right now with our second group of certifying companies, which includes the the companies that certified in the first year who are recertifying. It's about 150 of those, and then another 150 or so that are doing it for the first time. And before they use the label, they have to complete that offset step, and they have to file their reduction plans with us. And so once we've gone through the three steps, we've gotten a footprint calculation from them and we've approved that. We've gotten the offset purchase documented and offsets retired. And then we've gotten a reduction plan. Only then is the certification awarded. Sure. Someone else wants to know if companies can use the calculator later for SBTI verification? Uh, no, science-based target setting is a different process. So right. yeah, we'll, we'll find probably ways to align more over the years. But um, you know, one of the things that we've, we've discovered is that the science-based targets uh, framework, you know, it, it, it's kind of mostly was initially built around larger companies than frankly, most of the companies in the outdoor industry and larger companies than we've, than we've tended to work with so far. Up into the hundreds of millions of dollars would still be considered a small company um, in the SBTI framework. And so, um, you know, we've, we've started off with a group of companies that have incredibly passionate, strong brands, passionate customers, but um, tend to be in that, you know, sort of, I'd say 20 to 20, 20 million in revenues to up to a billion or two. Sure. Uh, someone else says that, uh, I just heard you referring to mitigating the, offset, the offsets and it might be helpful to point out that mitigate does not equal offset. Mitigate is what we're doing by investing in actual reductions in our emissions to avoid our carbon footprint to begin with. Uh, offset is a retroactive spend, not a reduction. Um, point taken. <laughs> and I think, but I mean, you look at the entire, I mean, as we've talked before, I mean, I, I don't think if a company were simply offsetting, you know, simply kind of trying to, to get around actually making a, a a real effort to reduce emissions that's not going to fly with you guys necessarily is it yeah i mean there's there's a lot of i think a lot of passion about this relationship between offsetting and reductions right. um that you know i think leads people to be very careful or specific about you know what one thing is versus another honestly the the way we're we're looking at this problem is that companies need to spend more to deal with the, each ton of carbon that they're responsible for creating. And at this point, I think we're fairly indifferent as to whether that comes in a given year, in other words, this year from reductions or, or offsets. Over time, we know that those emissions from the company have to trend downward and they must trend downward because there's no way to get to global net zero by 2050. But as I mentioned earlier, and the point of those charts was if we simply say, all right, reductions by 2050, that's the goal. There's far too much risk being put into 
future actions that, you know, two, three, four CEOs down the road, somebody realizes, oh shit, it's 2040 and, you know, we haven't reduced our emissions. What do we do now? Sure. So, um, yeah, and, and there are available, there are ways to, um, now I'm all nervous about the words that I choose, but, you know, there are ways <laughs> to, there are ways to sequester, to capture, to compensate for your emissions um, where, you know, th that, are, that are available today that we're not investing in. And so we're trying to drive more investment into those types of projects. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing that we're kind of looking at is the fact that the carbon offset instrument or the carbon, carbon credit instrument is, in my mind, significantly underused in, you know, as a climate solution. Sure. So the, the basic, we haven't sort of talked about what is a carbon offset versus a carbon removal versus a carbon credit. You know, again, lots, lots of words kind of can become a word salad pretty quickly, but um, the action of a company or an individual saying, here's X number of dollars to take a ton of carbon out of the atmosphere or to avoid a ton of carbon being emitted. Um, it, it can be a very simple one and, and it can be extended to a whole range of technologies that will be the foundation of a net zero economy. And that's why a carbon offset project, you know, people typically think it's a, uh, something like a tree planting project, but carbon offsets can come from installing electric vehicle charging stations. They can come from installing, build, building wind farms and, and, and putting solar panels up. There's a whole wide range of projects that can be supported. And as we're able to get more and more money into uh, voluntarily paid into this market, we will see more and more projects come online. So it, it sort of becomes a little bit less relevant whether we're talking about um, you know, this as an offset or mitigation or anything else because you know, we're, we're decarbonizing at a large scale. Sure. I think I, we've got a lot more, more questions, but I think I was gonna get onto one of my own questions and something I think we talked about that's fascinating too, is that because the calculation process uh, and the certification process goes throughout the supply chain, as you were saying, from raw materials to the sneakers showing up at your door. Uh, when people do this, they're also finding ways to make their business much more efficient by looking at their whole supply chain, right? It's a, it's a real audit of the whole company and how efficiently it runs in certain ways. So not only are you getting the carbon uh, net zero, but you're also looking at a better way to run your company when you're doing this, right? Yeah, I mean that's that's not our primary goal, but it certainly has become um, you know something that we hear pretty commonly that just by giving someone a framework to understand which parts of their operations are causing carbon emissions, they then have a different vocabulary and a different way of looking at uh, you know things that could be improved. Just like any sort of audit process, you know, there's there's kind of performance opportunities that, that get uncovered. And you know, something that we're trying to facilitate is collaboration with companies that are working on similar problems that have, that, that, that have turned up in this process. And you know, to the extent that we can get people collaborating on you know, information sharing and even negotiating with uh, value chain with, with, with common suppliers in their value chain, that starts to feel like real operational change uh, because, you know, Every, every company that places orders from a factory has some leverage over that factory. And if you can get a whole bunch of those companies together, then there's an opportunity to have, to have more of an impact. And, and this can be a good, almost political solution too, right? When we're not just talking about climate or just talking about this righteous thing, we're also talking about a way that you can make your business better and more efficient for everyone. And that's hard to argue with, no matter your, your political beliefs on the subject, right? Yeah, no, it is an interesting sort of element of this, which is, you know, what's the difference between a carbon tax and a, a climate neutral certification? I mean, if those things are comparable in any way, right? Well, a carbon tax is an amount per ton, amount of time, amount of, um, you know, money per ton of carbon that's levied on an entity. And what happens to those tax revenues? Well, the government decides what happens to those tax revenues. And, you know, I, I firmly believe there's a role for government in, you know, a lot of ways and a lot of ways that, that you know, they're not playing a role today. But, the, one of the elegant pieces of, of a carbon credit is that it literally is money that just goes directly into a carbon project, a carbon abatement project. And so all else equal, if you're paying five, 10, 15, $20 a ton for carbon, it's a much more direct line to the carbon reduction if you're paying it through this kind of market mechanism as opposed to paying it as a carbon tax. 
All right, let's get back into some of the listener questions here. I think there's a good one talking about uh, the, the thread we're on right here. Someone says that you stated the measurement starts at the beginning of the supply chain to the consumer's door. I stated that, I'm not sure if you did or not, but uh, how do you capture that the emission uh, from a brand's warehouse through Amazon to the consumer? Does Amazon provide for their emissions rate? Amazon in particular, um, you know, it, it depends on the, the actual, so we, with every company that we certify, we kind of look at how they're shipping products. And I'll take this a little bit away from, uh, maybe there's something about Amazon that the listener is, is asking that I'm not catching, but, you know, in, in general, we base the emission calculation on a specific analysis of how products are getting to customers. You know, is there a last mile shipping company involved? Is there somebody who's an intermediary who takes possession of the, who, who buys the products and then ships them onward? You know, this all relates to kind of where you draw the circle, where you draw the boundaries of, of the company's responsibility. But the simplest example or the simplest chain is sort of where a company has something that they design, it's manufactured, it's shipped to a warehouse, it's shipped to another warehouse, a distribution center, and eventually makes its way to the customer, regardless of whether there are entities in the middle there who are playing roles in, in bringing things to, to the customer, um, all those emissions fall to the, fall to the brand. Um, so someone else wants to know if there are any plans for historical measure and offset. So, you know, you guys are, they, they want to know if they can measure an offset, uh, for years before becoming certified from 2013 to 2018. Can you look back at, at previous years? Yeah, again, this kind of gets to that notion of compensation and some of the, you know, some of the software companies, Microsoft is an example, uh, have made, Intuit has done something like this. They've made large announcements around cleaning up all of their historical emissions as they move toward net zero. We don't require it of companies, but we do record the amount of historical carbon offsetting or compensation that a brand has done, and we put that onto their brand profile page. So if a company has been certified at 10,000 tons for two years, but has also done 100,000 tons of, kind of cleaning up of its historical footprint, then we'll put that onto the profile page. So it's certainly an option. Um, honestly, you know, it, it's enough work to try to get companies to take one year at a time that we haven't gone too deeply into cleaning up historical emissions, but we'd love to get there. Sure. Uh, there was another question early on about the, the role of regenerative agriculture in uh, reaching net zero. I mean, I, I mean, I think that's an even broader question in uh, the, the bigger graphs that you were looking at for, for everyone, uh, how important regenerative agriculture can be in that. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I mean, on the one hand, shifting all agriculture to regenerative practices is, is critical. You know, ag is a, is a pretty big source of emissions. On the other hand, there is a lot of debate over just how powerful regenerative ag can be on a carbon kind of carbon offset, uh, as a carbon offset source. And specifically what people challenge is whether regenerative ag can be a long-term carbon sink because that's really what's needed. You need to, to sequester carbon and hold it there for a long, a long time. And most regenerative agriculture carbon credits only require that you, they're issued annually, right? So there's a growing season that happens, let's say in North America from you know, May, June until, until September. And when a farmer changes practices during that growing season, there's a, you know, a modeling exercise that goes on to say, what did you change? And how is that going to change the soil carbon content within your farm? And how many acres was your farm? And at the end of it, here's your 5,000 carbon credits. And the presumption is that the things that you did that year are going to capture, going to increase this, the, the carbon content in your soil a certain amount. And that's, that's equal to the amount of carbon offset that you, that you did. What happens next year, if you go back to conventional practices, Right, how much of that carbon is actually lost. And so the lack of permanence around regenerative ag is, is problematic from an offset perspective, which isn't to say that, car, that regenerative ag offsets don't exist, but they, they, right. they, they do become um, you know, a little bit harder to assess if they're really just short-term like that. So yeah, I mean, it's important for the industry to shift there. You know, we, we definitely encourage people to, to kind of think of it, especially when they have, um, you know, for food companies that have wheat, corn, soy, et cetera, in their, in their products. 
but um, yeah, but there's some challenges. Sure. Um, there was another good question earlier on, and someone wanted to know if there's a more aggressive target that company for companies who are uh, uh, in order to make up for the companies that won't make changes. So if we need total to be zero by 2050, and only 50% of us are making the required changes, uh, do we need to do twice as much? Can we can we make up for the companies that aren't complying? I mean, yeah, it's we we do look a little bit. Um, we have, we have looked a little bit at whether to introduce a, a climate positive. Um, a climate positive designation where companies are going above and beyond their footprint in, in terms of compensation. And if there are companies that want to do that, you know, we'll, we'll again sort of record how much they're compensating on top. And we, we have a couple, probably three or four brands that are doing this. They're taking their footprint, multiplying it by some number, two, three, in some cases, you know, a hundred or a thousand. Um, and purchasing carbon credits equal to to that multiple of their footprint. Um, again, you know, like cleaning up historical emissions, any sort of you know massive step beyond what neutrality would actually involve is it would be tremendous. But it, we don't see that as a model that's going to take off at scale, at least at the moment. Sure. Um, and and also early on, someone had some interesting questions about. Uh, uh, choices individuals can make and whether purchasing online versus buying a local gear shop works. So uh, are you guys concerned with, uh, and I think you and I were talking about vegan butter or bike commuting, you know, these individual solutions, uh, how much will they all add up and how important are they uh, when it comes down to it? Or is it something you can also encourage your employees to make these individual uh, decisions? Does that help in, in a company's profile? I mean, I, every 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 little bit counts, right? I guess the you know the, the kind of the classic question here is like a you know paper versus plastic straw, and are you going to save the world with the plastic with with the paper straw? And and my general cynicism toward the you know the, the the paper straw movement is it makes us feel like we're doing something really significant by choosing a paper straw, not a plastic straw. And in fact, we're not. I mean, yes, there are lots of straws that are or would be consumed if everybody, you know, chose to use a straw with every drink. And it's yeah, generally a good idea to get rid of single use plastics, including straws, but it's not going to, if you, if you compare the effect of that, you know, straw switch to the, the effect of driving a mile in your car or getting on an airplane or heating your house with fossil fuels, it's just not even remotely close. So yes, the sum of like, you know, millions and millions of individual actions is really important, but it does, I think, invite us to focus on things that are much less significant than, you know, than the important stuff. Yeah. I think, you know, we're coming close to the end of that, right? We can maybe go back and try to get some more of these questions. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have some questions on here that haven't been answered or we don't get to yet, uh, you know, uh, Sarah, our moderator, is going to have those and be able to send those to Austin and his team so that they will be able to respond to any questions we have in here that we don't get to. Um, but as we move in a little bit, I mean, Austin, I just wanted to ask you kind of personally, you've 20 years you've spent in working on, on, climate and reduction in this and now working here with climate neutral do you feel like this is a big win are you personally really excited to be doing this and and you feel like you're actually making a difference now in ways you might have not before i mean certainly um if i look at the if i look at the actual numbers of what's coming out of the the work that we're doing i mean we try to boil it down boil the impact down to a very very basic thing which is how many tons of carbon are we measuring and offsetting every year and what's the trend of that over time that feels like a massive impact and you know someone early on said to me wow that's pretty cool that if you could you know as a professional legacy say that you help mobilize you know literally billions of dollars into decarbonization yeah uh, that'd be a thing to be pretty proud of. Um, we got a long way to go to get there, but it feels like the start that we're on right now has been really fortuitous and, and, and it's going well. I also think that, you know, just, just thinking more generally, our timing has been like, it has been really strong. Um, the, the amount of interest 
passion, the number of people who are leaving their jobs and deciding to go work on climate, the number of people who are just much more literate in the climate problem, who are you know binge reading climate literature, that is just not something that we've ever seen ever in history um, of, of the climate movement. And so I don't wanna come close to taking credit for all the momentum you know, that the organization has. And that's a good thing because, you know, I think that there's so much that's happening far bigger than us that, that, that feels promising when you have many major companies making announcements um, to take climate seriously, when you have individuals, like I said, you know, fundamentally changing the direction of their careers to, to focus on climate. It feels like a structural shift uh, at this time that is just, you know, really significant. So, yeah, I'm fired up about what we're doing. I mean, I, I have never worked harder in my life and I feel like the, um, you know, the, the outcome is really, really clear when we talk to companies and the people within those companies who are getting excited about the impact that they can have. But um, yeah, there's, you know, there's certainly a lot more that we got to do. And what are your, you know, what's, what's your ideal goal for, for you know, in a year from now? What's your goal? What do you want to see uh, Climate Neutral be doing and, and how you guys evolve in the next year? Yeah, and I mentioned this the other day when we were chatting. I, I think one of the things is that I want to see us be more active and pr proactive in shaping kind of expectations in the voluntary carbon market and defining what, you know, what should and could be used um, as, you know, a credible compensation, you know, or, you know, carbon reduction mechanism. Um, there are certainly many entities who are looking at this, at this problem of how do you create a quality carbon offset. Um, I think that we can play a more active role in that. And we're already starting to do some things um, to, to make that happen. Just very basic, you know, our, our goal of getting 250 companies on board in 2020 uh, is already in the rear view mirror. And we're now on our way up to 500, which is where we want to be by the end of this year. So we're going to keep recruiting companies. We also want to increase the average size of the companies that we're working with so that we can get, we can increase that impact in terms of the number of tons of carbon. So we'd love to be maybe around five, ton, 5 million tons of carbon by the end of this year. Um, and you, know, you mentioned the technology, the software. I think that we're just at the tip of the iceberg of what we can do there to use technology to make this process easy and repeatable and scalable for companies so that more and more people just very easily can get in and actually become sort of part of this movement. I think one other thing we didn't touch on that's really important too is this is way beyond the outdoor industry. You guys started in the outdoor industry because it's a very uh, you know fertile place to kind of launch and people like it. But you were telling me that kombucha brands are really involved now and it's really going beyond the outdoor industry. Can you talk a bit about some of the other brands that are involved and in other industries you're looking at and moving into? Yeah, I mean, outdoor has been just an amazing place to launch because there is a, there is a great community of people, you know, great community of consumers, and then the people who, who run and work um, work in these companies that we work with uh, are just are just tremendously passionate about the environment and climate. But we quickly moved from outdoor to just more general kind of durable consumer goods, things that you sort of buy and you have for a while. And um, clothing, fashion, um, you know, the fashion industry is trying to deal with a legacy of environmental harm and um, and climate is certainly factoring into that. So we've got a lot of fashion brands on board. Home goods uh, has been another one. And then from there, we've, we've gotten into health and beauty a little bit, and then food and beverage. Those are kind of the, the other major categories. So you know, the, 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 the commonality for all these organizations is, you know, do they make products that people think about a lot when they buy them, as opposed to buying them reflexively? And um, you know, are they products that are there products that um, if you kind of march up the supply chain, there's, you know, there's obvious opportunities to reduce carbon emissions. And so, um, yeah, so it's becoming a, a very broad based community of people, not just, not just in the outdoor industry. And one of the things that we've heard from companies is they're, you know, they're used to interacting with just, uh, you know, others from, from their relatively narrow space, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's snack food brands or, or what have you. But because the label is so all encompassing, unlike say a USDA organic label, which is really just for one type of product, 
um, it gives the it gives companies the opportunity to collaborate with other companies that make totally dissimilar products but are on very similar journeys when it comes to dealing with carbon. Sure. Uh, we've got about five minutes left, so uh, maybe we can squeeze in some other questions after this. But finally, I'd just like to ask you if there's anything else that you're uh, really passionate about or feel that we didn't cover or feel that, you know, as a as a conclusion here, people need to know about climate neutral and your work and, and what you do. Well, I feel like it's been pretty rapid fire and we haven't had much time for levity in this. We've had, we've had a very <laughs> serious conversation, um, which, you know, this doesn't have to be this, this whole effort, I think, doesn't have to be all, all serious, right? And I think that that's one of the things that we're trying to make possible is that climate has felt like this really sort of difficult and vexing problem. And, you know, is it is it just about moving into a tiny, tiny house and, you know, stopping everything that we, that we know and love uh, in terms of our daily activities? And, uh, you know, it, it, some people will be, will be happy to go that path, but um, most people won't. And what we're constantly looking for is something that will scale, something that will attract a great, the greatest number of people, greatest number of participants, whether it's on the company side or whether it's on the consumer side. Um, so we're thinking a lot about how to you know, um, relate to individuals, relate to consumers in a way that I think the climate movement has typically or traditionally failed to do. Um, you know, throw a IPCC report at anybody and they'll probably just decide to use it as a as a coaster, not, not actually read it. And, and that's a real problem. So, uh, you know, there's a big opportunity for us to do that and yeah, and to make it a process that feels like, you know, both participatory and fun. On a light note, someone wants to know about the typewriter in the background there, if you use that, if that's, uh, <laughs> if that's climate neutral. Yeah, it's actually funny. You know, someone wrote me a handwritten note the other day and I decided to respond to the letter on the typewriter. It, it is a, um, it is a real typewriter. It's a working typewriter. Um, I rescued it from the trash can, but um, oh. yeah. Uh, but another person wants to know if climate neutral itself is certified as climate neutral. Uh, we do count our emissions. Yep, there's not a whole lot of them. We've got four people, and then you know it's basically a bunch of a bunch of IT. Um, so yeah, but yes, we are. We we reserve ourselves um, a set of tons every year. Uh, and someone else, we want to know if there are any connections and projects within the European Outdoor Group. Uh, you working with European brands as well? We've had some conversations with them. We do work with some European brands. We've, we've had some conversations with the European Outdoor Group. Um, nothing official right now, um, but we'd love to see more collaboration with folks across the pond. And uh, what's the best way, uh, you know, someone who's listening here wants to know how can they encourage a leadership at their company uh, to start working with you guys? How can, how can people, employees get leadership to listen? Yeah, I know the, the thing that we hear often is we'll do this. This is from, from CEOs. We'll do this when we know that customers care and employees care. And, you know, this, the, again, kind of in the column of trends that we think are really positive, I would say employee pressure on corporate management um, and, and even prospective employee pressure on corporate management is really, really significant. So when you interview somebody and they ask you what your sustainability and climate policies are, um, that's, that's a real driver. So, you know, I think number one, let them know that you care. And number two, let them know that it may seem confusing from the outset, but there is a clear path that you can follow and it's probably not going to cost any near as much any anywhere near as much as you would expect it to great and, and we're coming right up on the hour there that was a lot a lot of rapid fire stuff on you you did an amazing job of responding to a lot of questions i think this topic you know uh the questions we've been getting in are it's really technical people know what they're talking about and as you said there's a lot of debate on things and uh uh, I think everyone in the audience appreciates the work that you do and the work that Climate Neutral does. Hopefully this will help move the needle even more. Uh, any questions we didn't get to, as I said, we'll get those to Austin and try to get uh, replies to them. There were a lot of really technical questions, which was great. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for being here. I wanna thank you, Austin, and, and thank you guys for the work that you're doing. Uh, next month, we're gonna be talking with OmniSend and Visitor. And uh, we'll be talking about e-commerce and data. So that should be a convers good conversation as well. And that will be uh, in Outdoor Retailer Magazine in the April issue, which will come out uh, beginning of the month. 
so again, I wanted to thank everyone for being here uh, and especially thank you, Austin. And I think it was a great conversation. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, I think I uh, need to catch a breath now, but um, amaz <laughs> amazing. I, I, I mean, I've never been in a, you know, an online panel with this much engagement. So that's a testament to the folks that you've rounded up and, you know, and the, and the passion in this space. So that was really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And you can find this whole session recorded on the Outdoor Retailer website. Take care, everyone. Bye.